divorce and remarriage. The churches of England gave way on this in the mid-60s, and it's had a devastating effect ever since, though they don't all trace it back to that. But I was then on a commission set up by the Evangelical Alliance of England because the government was going to change the law on divorce from having to prove a reason for a divorce to making any divorce legal if it's requested by the couple. If it's requested by them both, they can have a divorce in two years. And if it's not requested by one of the two, they have to wait five years. But it virtually meant divorce on demand of the people who want one. And it's had a devastating effect on English society. It's virtually become divorce by request and therefore remarriage by request. I want to share this burden with you because I don't know where you are on this issue here, but it's going to become an increasingly difficult issue for the churches. And I don't want you to make the mistakes the churches in England made. There are plenty of people shouting out about abortion and about homosexual activity and now gay marriage. But Jesus said nothing about those things but he said a great deal about divorce and remarriage. And it was neglecting that and accepting those things inside the church that actually led to all the other problems we've got. And we have therefore lost our moral authority to speak on anything of sexual ethics because the churches gave way on Jesus' teaching on that which was crucial. And I don't want you to do the same if you still have a chance not to give way on that teaching of Jesus. Then you will have the authority to speak on all the other matters of sexual ethics that are thrown at us. And my reason for saying that is that this is precisely the argument that is being thrown at us now, even by bishops. Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa has said on BBC, evangelicals have no right to speak about homosexuality or gay marriage when they are accepting divorces and remarriages. So that's being thrown at us very publicly. So I want just to take you very quickly through what the Bible says on this crucial subject. We begin with what God said at the very beginning. It was God who instituted marriage. And it's amazing that right there in the second chapter of Genesis is a statement which Jesus later would quote and which Paul quotes, which is so fundamental. Genesis 1, God made male and female. Genesis 2, he said, it's right for a man to leave his own family, to leave his parents, and to cleave to his wife. That word cleave is a very interesting word. It means to be glued to his wife, to stick with his wife, to stay attached to his wife, meaning as long as they're both alive. And here is the picture of the relationship between male and female as God intended it. One man married to one woman for life. A heterosexual marriage which is permanent. And that's why that verse is appealed to right through the New Testament as fundamental to God. The other thing God said on this subject is one of the Ten Commandments, which are such an important summary of his laws for Israel. And the seventh commandment was, you shall not commit adultery. The commandments are all based on respect. 
respect for God, respect for his name, respect for his day, and then respect for your parents, respect for life, respect for marriage, respect for property, respect for other people's reputation. The whole of a healthy, happy society is built on respect. But if there's one thing that is rapidly disappearing from our society back in England, it's respect. We don't respect teachers now. They're constantly being assaulted by pupils. We don't respect the police now because so much corruption has been revealed in the police. We don't respect any figure's authority. And there's a general attitude of lawlessness coming in. But you can expect that in a post-Christian society. Respect comes from the law of God. And when people no longer think about the law of God as a guide, respect disappears. And it's so crucial to a healthy, happy community. Well, now that's what God said at the beginning, and it's absolutely clear. What Moses said was a little different, and it's a compromise on that. And he allowed, in Deuteronomy 24, he allowed, he didn't command it, but he allowed people to divorce and remarry. The one thing he did not allow and came out very strongly against was going back to your first partner after you'd been married to another. And he regarded that as blasphemy to God and a very serious sin to commit for God's people. At the same time, in Deuteronomy 22, it is quite clear that God forbade sex before marriage, which is usually called fornication. Adultery being forbidden sin after marriage and fornication being forbidden sin before marriage. One of the um, uncommitted and one for the committed in marriage. And in Deuteronomy 22, Moses insisted on the virginity of the bride at the wedding and legislated for the discovery that your wife was not a virgin, that she was second-hand goods, and therefore she had already had sexual intercourse before they married. And that was punishable by death. But it was very carefully examined, and if that accusation was made and proved untrue, there were serious consequences for the bridegroom. It may sound a bit unfair, this. There was no demand for the bridegroom to be a virgin. I believe there should have been in a totally fair society. But the bride's virginity was proved in physical evidence, in blood. As the hymen was penetrated by the male, there was usually a flow of blood. And blood on the bed sheet was the evidence produced for her guilt or innocence. That's Moses. Interestingly enough, Jesus himself said Moses was compromising on that and adjusting God's law to human weakness, presumably because it was so common in Moses' day, divorce and remarriage, that he had to adjust the law of Israel to that situation. We move on to what the prophets said. Hosea we'll treat with first. Hosea was told by God, go out and find a wife among the prostitutes on the street. And Hosea must have been shocked. He said, I can see the headlines in the newspaper, prophet marries prostitute. And he was shocked. But God had told him to do that. And then God said, and you will have children, and I'm afraid at least one of them will not be yours. 
And then after three children, she go, she's going to go back on the streets to her old profession, what's called the oldest profession in the world. And then what do I do? Said Hosea, well then, says God, I want you to go and find her and buy her back from the pimp who's controlling her. her bring her back into your house and discipline her and then take her again as your wife. And Hosea said, why do you want me to do all that? And God said, because I want you to feel like I feel. And then you'll tell Israel convincingly that they have betrayed my love, that they are an adulteress. And if you feel like that about your unfaithful wife, you will be able to tell them that's exactly how I feel. And that'll give you a message punch. And that's what Hosea did. Jeremiah is the next I want to quote. In Jeremiah chapter 8, God says to Israel, you've betrayed me, you're an adulteress, and so I'm going to write out a bill of divorce and you will cease to be my people. And uh, that's how they divorced people in those days. They didn't go to a, a court. It wasn't a matter of public law. They wrote out a bill of divorce. The husband wrote it out because I'm afraid wives were not allowed to divorce. divorce. The husbands did in those days. And they had to give their wife a bill saying they were divorced. And that bill was their security in finding another husband. And God is here saying in Jeremiah 8, I'm writing out a bill of divorce. But God didn't marry anyone else. And in the same chapter, he makes it qu quite clear, you are still my wife. And he calls her that after the divorce. And he promises in Jeremiah that he would always bring her back so that it's not a divorce with a view to being free from Israel and marrying someone else at all. It's a divorce that still regards Israel as his wife, but there's clearly to be a separation. And that, of course, was what the exile into Babylon meant for God and for Israel, a temporary separation coming together again later. I've met a number of Christians who've been married twice to the same woman. There's a Christian TV producer, has a channel for the gospel in Switzerland, and he, he was one of the loveliest Christians I've met. And I was so disappointed when someone said to me, of course he's been married twice. And I went straight back to him and said, have you been married twice? He said, yes, to the same woman. He said, before I became a Christian, we divorced and separated. When, when we both became Christians, or he said, when I became a Christian, she was one already. He said, when I became a Christian as well as she, I had to start courting her all over again. And for months he courted her and loved her and then married her all over again. Oh, I said, I'm so glad. And that really took away any difficulties I had immediately. Well, God remarried Israel after 70 years of separation. He didn't turn to anyone else. Malachi, of course, reveals God's real heart about divorce and remarriage. And there Malachi the prophet says, I hate divorce because he called it a covenant. And he said, you Israelites are breaking the covenant of your youth, which probably indicates that they were experiencing the familiar midlife crisis or the seven-year itch, as Hollywood has called it. Now, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there were 
there was a period of some three to four hundred years when God was silent and said nothing, which was a very strange experience. There was no prophet to tell them what God was saying. And so they grew up in that time teachers called scribes. And these scribes would take what God had said in the past and was written in our Old Testament and then explain it and apply it. And I'm afraid they would slip in quite a bit of their own ideas at that time, which became known as the traditions. And it was during that period that there was a furious discussion about divorce and remarriage. And there were two scribes in particular that we need to talk about whose names we think, we don't know this, but we think they were around at Jesus' time. And they were debating this issue on the basis of Deuteronomy 24, where it's said that divorce, for some cases, can be over an unclean thing. And the great debate was, what is this unclean thing? It was a superfluous debate because Deuteronomy 24 also allowed a husband to divorce his wife simply because he wanted to. But they centered this whole debate on this unclean thing. What was a legitimate reason for divorce and what was not? And the two scribes who were prominent leaders in the debate were Hillel, H-I-L-L-E-L, and Shammai, S-H-A-W-M-I-A. And we presume that these were the two schools of thinking about divorce and remarriage, which caused so much discussion in Jesus' day. And the big question he was asked was, which view he subscribed to. Because the view of Shammai was the strict view that he said the unclean thin thing is adultery only. Whereas Hillel was more liberal than that and said it could be for other things, like a wife burning the breakfast, like a wife talking to men in the street, like a wife shouting, at her husband. And he had a whole list of things that he felt were unclean things and justified divorce. So it was a big debate between the strict view, adultery only, and the liberal view of quite a long list. Both agreed there had to be a valid reason for divorce and remarriage. Actually, they were quite wrong. Um, at least Shammai was quite wrong to say it was divorce. And since Hillel included that, he was also wrong because adultery in the Old Testament was punished by death. So it couldn't have been the unclean thing in Moses, but that's what they were saying. Shammai said it's only adultery and Hillel said it's adultery plus, 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 a lot of other reasons but they were both wrong to include adultery because it was a capital crime and was punished by death, which of course did release one party to marry again since their partner was dead, been put to death. Well, now those were the scribes. Whether or not Shammai and Hillel were contemporaries of Jesus, no one knows for sure. But the way that Jesus discussed it seems to hint that people were asking, are you for Shammai or Hillel? And that may well be true. Those two scribes were followed by another scribe called Akiba, A-Q-I-B-A, if you're writing things down, and he went really liberal. And, but he came after Jesus, 
And he said you can be divorced for any reason at all or no reason at all, just your choice. That's how the laws of England followed the same downward trend. You had to establish a real reason, especially adultery, a hundred years ago in England. And I'm afraid there were many hotels in Brighton, which is about 50 miles from London, where the hotels offered a chambermaid who would sleep with you the night and then swear afterwards that um, you had committed adultery and then you could divorce your, your wife. It was called off to Brighton for the day and it was a well-known way of getting a ground for a divorce. Of course, it was ridiculous, but it happened. But then from divorce, there came cruelty, there came uh, abuse, uh, physical or mental, there came insanity, and gradually the grounds for divorce increased. From a chamois position of mainly adultery to all sorts of other reasons. But I was on the commission in the middle of the 1960s when the government said, we're going to cancel having to make a reason for a divorce and simply make it if they want a divorce. And it was really following Shammai, Hillel and Akiba. And this is the way things go in society, in a liberal direction. And they just gradually increase the grounds for divorce and remarriage and then abolish them altogether and allow people simply to decide. Those who then get divorced and remarried are simply regarding marriage as a contract, a contract which has been broken in some, some way. So that's the background in the Bible to Jesus. And I now want to look at what he said, because for the Christian, what Jesus says comes high above everybody else. We follow Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And therefore it's vital what Jesus said. And indeed we are disciples if we observe whatever he commanded us. And there's no doubt he included divorce and remarriage in his teaching. It's in the first three Gospels. In the fourth gospel, we have some critical examples of how Jesus dealt with situations like this. But in the first three, we have his teaching. And there are three aspects, therefore, to Jesus' teaching and example. I want to speak first about his explanation as to why he took such a strong line on divorce and remarriage. Second, his exception, he did make an exception to his rule. And thirdly, his example of how he dealt with such situations. Then we'll move on to what Paul said. He said more than any of the other apostles on this subject. In fact, there are whole chapter, there's a whole chapter, 1 Corinthians 7, on this very subject. But he did also mention it in Romans and in his pastoral epistles to Timothy. So we'll look at all that in Paul in a moment. But first what Jesus said. His explanation, Jesus took a stricter view of divorce and remarriage than Moses certainly whom he criticized, or at least he said Moses was a compromise. And he went right back to Genesis 2 for the basis of his views. And then the exception he made in his example. But the explanation for his strict view, extremely strict view, a view that no other moral teacher has ever risen to, the highest standard of all. And you'll find this in Luke and Mark. In Luke chapter 16, 
verse 18, and in Mark chapter 10. Now this is very significant because both Mark and Luke were written for unbelievers and written for Gentiles. And to the Gentile world, Jesus makes an absolute statement, an absolute prohibition with no exception, with no qualifications. The only qualifications he makes are in Matthew. And that's very significant. So Mark and Luke give us Jesus' rule, which is the heart of his teaching. And that's the very basis. There's no point in discussing exceptions until you believe his rule. And his rule is in Mark and Luke. Mark 10, Luke 16. And that rule is very simple and very clear. And the rule is, whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman is committing adultery. And whoever marries a divorcee is also committing adultery. Now that simple rule needs to be unpacked a little. Adultery is the sin of a married person. Fornication is the sin of an unmarried, but adultery, for which the Greek word is moichia, M-O-I-C-H-I-A, moichia, that is always the sin of a married person. And therefore what Jesus is saying is, God doesn't recognize divorce. A divorce may be perfectly legal, and man may accept the marriage is over, but God doesn't. And therefore, if he marries again after a divorce, that's adultery against his first partner, to whom in God's sight he is still married. Now, I hope you follow that. I'm just unpacking what he said. Adultery, since it can only be the sin of a married person, means that after the divorce, the person is still married in God's sight, not in man's. In man's, the marriage is dissolved, but in God's sight, it's still there. And therefore, if he has sex with someone else, even though it's legal and it's within marriage, is actually adultery. And whoever marries a divorcee is doing the same thing. They are committing adultery against the woman's first husband because they are still married. That's the explanation of the very strict line that Jesus took against divorce and remarriage. Neither counts with God because they are all still married to their original partner in his sight and therefore are committing adultery. The next thing I want you to notice is that that verb, committing adultery, is in the present continuous tense in the Greek. And I've told you that means to go on doing something, to do it continually which means that in the remarriage, every time they have sexual intercourse, they are continuing committing adultery. They're living a life in an adulterous relationship, which God does not recognize. That's the heart of Jesus' teaching. In Luke, it's only one verse where he was talking to wealthy Pharisees who were quite notorious for changing their partners. And they were doing so on the teaching of the Jewish scribes. And when they asked Jesus, now which side are you on, Shammai or Hillel? He said, neither. I'm against it altogether. Because in my father's sight, it's adultery. It's the sin of married people. Now that's the basic thing. Mark does expand that. It begins with the discussion with Pharisees and 
Jesus and they discuss what Moses said and Jesus said that was the old law for Jews but I've come with a much stricter law and after they have a public discussion with the Pharisees they have a private discussion with the disciples and Jesus on their own and they said do you really mean that and he said yes I do anyone who marries a divorcee or anyone who divorces his wife and remarries that's adultery in my father's sight now so far that's quite uncompromising it's quite uh, absolute divorce and remarriage are wrong when you turn however to Matthew there is an exception in two places both in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount and particularly in Matthew 19 where three little words have crept in to the text when I say crept in I mean in comparison with Mark and Luke I don't mean that they uh, had crept in as a forgery or a fraud no I believe they're an accurate report of what Jesus said and so in Matthew 5 he says whoever divorces his wife is forcing her into adultery because she's going to marry again that was the only hope for a woman then there were no government subsidies for widows or for divorcees there was no welfare scheme and their only hope was to marry again so Jesus said anyone who divorces his wife is forcing her into a wrong relationship into adultery but he said that doesn't apply in the case of fornication to put it simply Matthew 5 says you're forcing your wife to commit sexual sin if you divorce her except in the case where she's already a sexual sinner that's the meaning of Matthew 5 and it doesn't really help us too far but Matthew 19 makes it much clearer again the phrase comes in whoever divorces his wife except for fornication is doing wrong and committing adultery if they remarry now why this exception and what does it mean and this is where there's been so much discussion argument among Bible scholars and so many I have found couples who want to divorce squeeze into this exception if they possibly can and prove that they are the exception well now there are three understandings of this exception and I'm giving you all three to be fair the first group say that this means adultery that fornication here means adultery my answer to that is why didn't Jesus say so he didn't say moikai in the exception which is adultery he said pornia p-o-r-n-e-i-a pornia from which we get the word pornography means illicit sex but there are those who say that pornia and mokaya are just simply synonyms and just for literary variety Jesus used both words for the same thing and that's why in the NIV for example it's translated adultery but it is a different word but that's how some preachers have interpreted it and some scholars behind them that it's simply another word for adultery and that therefore if your wife has committed adultery after the marriage or if your husband has you are fully justified 
in divorcing them and remarrying and that that sets you free to do that. I don't accept that because adultery and fornication are listed together but separately in the lists of sins in the New Testament. Even in Matthew's Gospel, they're listed together but separately where Jesus says the evil of the heart comes out of the mouth, such as adultery and fornication. And he clearly distinguished them, Paul does, when he says nobody's going to enter the kingdom of God who's still practicing fornication or adultery. Now, I don't think they would ever have used those two words separately but together in a list of sins, if they were the same thing. That sounds crazy. So the second, which is the more common interpretation, is that fornication refers to all sexual sins, including adultery. The first interpretation says they are equal synonyms for the same sin. The second sin says that Adultery is one sexual sin and fornication covers all sexual sin. Therefore, it would c cover any sexual sin of your partner. Uh, masturbation would give you an excuse, a reason rather, for divorce. Even according to Jesus, a husband looking at girls would give a reason for divorce. But um, homosexual relations would give a reason for divorce. Anything sexually sinful is what's meant by fornication and therefore includes adultery, but many other sexual sins. That's the second interpretation, which is the more usual one accepted to justify divorce. And of course, that's quite an elastic concept of fornication, which then gets stretched and stretched to cover almost anything. But that's the second approach to the exception. My approach to the exception is this. Why is there only an exception in Matthew and not in Mark and Luke? And the first beginning of the answer is that Matthew is a gospel for young believers and primarily Jewish believers. It is clearly written with Jews in mind. It begins with the family tree of Jesus, which is the first interest of a Jew in Jesus. It's not the interest of Gentiles. Gentiles, I nearly said, couldn't be bothered, but Gentiles are not usually most interested in the family tree. But to a Jew, that's crucial. Is he the son of David? And therefore, Matthew begins with the family tree of Jesus. He's obviously writing for Jewish converts. And all the records point to the fact that Matthew was written for the earliest churches in the Promised Land, which were Jewish churches. And he was teaching them very quickly how to live in the kingdom. Secondly, Matthew, instead of using the phrase kingdom of God, as Mark and Luke do, uses the phrase kingdom of heaven, which again, Jews are very reluctant to say the word God. Even in the Jerusalem Chronicle, the newspaper today, God is always written big G dash little d. And you know who they mean, but they just dare not write the word God. And they usually use the word heaven instead of God so that they avoid taking his name in vain. And they will say, pray to heaven. Heaven will help you, meaning God, but not using the word for God. And so, to Jewish believers, Matthew is using kingdom of heaven instead of Mark and Luke's kingdom of God. There are many other things which I could tell you.
Uh, one of the intriguing things is that Matthew groups all Jesus' sayings into five sermons on the kingdom. Matthew 5 to 7, the lifestyle of the kingdom. Matthew 10, the mission of the kingdom. Matthew 13, the growth of the kingdom. Matthew 18, the community of the kingdom. Matthew 24 to 25, the future of the kingdom. He's actually put Jesus' teaching into five blocks as a reflection of the fact that Moses wrote five books. And therefore he's subtly saying, here are the new five books of the new Moses. There are many other indications as you go through, one of which is Matthew alone always says that it might be fulfilled, might be fulfilled as spoken by the prophet. All the way through, he's proving Jesus is the Messiah by quoting the prophets. Mark and Luke don't do that for the writing for Gentiles, but to a Jew, that's a very important issue. Now putting that and many other reasons I could give you together, it's clear that he's writing for Jews, for young Jews. Of course, that doesn't mean we can't be immensely helped by it, because there were young believers and we need to know that. And therefore it's very helpful to us as well. But it's primarily written for the Jewish community. And therefore, in the Jewish community, fornication, sex before marriage, was a very big matter. And in fact, it's Matthew who records that Jesus' own parents nearly divorced during their engagement because Mary had apparently had sex. You see, to a Jew, engagement is virtually married. It hasn't been consummated yet. It's not become a physical relationship yet, but it's promised to be. And the Jews take betrothal or engagement far more seriously than we do in Western society. They were virtually married when they got engaged, when they were betrothed to each other. And therefore, while they were betrothed, Mary becomes pregnant. What could her young man think except that she'd been having fornication, that she'd been having sex with someone else? And it says, being a just man, he resolved to divorce her privately. So the word divorce is used in that context. If you break an engagement in a Jewish community, that's equivalent to divorce. The marriage is off. And Joseph would have been fully justified in divorcing Mary because it was obvious when your girl becomes pregnant before you're married. What could Joseph think? But he had a dream. And you know, his namesake in the Old Testament was also a dreamer. And I, there's very little said about Joseph, the foster father of Jesus, and yet he must have been a great man. Because as a young man, he dreamt, and he dreamt that God told him in the dream, it's all right, she hasn't been unfaithful to you. She, she is pregnant by me, says God. And the young man woke up and he believed the dream and was the first man in history to believe such a thing. I'm amazed, dear Joseph. And it says as soon as he woke up, he said, Mary, let's get married immediately. And that dear young man was willing to take the blame for the pregnancy immediately and marry her because she was still 
only three months pregnant. And so this young man, Joseph, said, I'll marry you straight away and let people blame me. And that's exactly what he did. <laughs> I have a great admiration for Joseph. Yet you rarely hear him preached about, do you? But he covered it up for Mary by virtually telling the world, it's my baby. There was a play on British television about the Christmas story last year. And the trouble was, it left Joseph wondering who the man was, just to make it more dramatic. And he didn't discover it was God until they got to Bethlehem, which rather spoiled the story from my mind. That's not the true story. He married her immediately and took the responsibility of having a wife who was pregnant before marriage but he could rightly have divorced her. It would have been accepted in a Jewish community. Well, now that's the background to Matthew. And Matthew is highlighting the situation of someone who has sex before marriage. And I believe fornication is sex before marriage and adultery is sex after marriage. And I've got a book at home, which I've mentioned in my little book on divorce, uh, which you ought to get if you're considering what fornication means, whereby an American scholar has to me prove beyond doubt that fornication is limited to unmarried sex. And adultery means sex of the married with someone else other than their own partner. So I am absolutely convinced that the other two explanations for the exception are not really true to scripture. And that fornication is the one exception. And Jesus is saying, if you discover before or at the time of your marriage, that your partner is not a virgin, that you're not the first they've had, that you are justified in calling the marriage off, even if it's taken place. But that is so rare an occurrence, largely because it is now widely accepted that a married couple have had sex with each other before they married or sex with others before they married. Fornication is so common now. I always ask a married a couple I'm going to marry now, have either of you had sex either with each other or with someone else? Then you better confess it now and let's get it dealt with before you're married. Is that being very strict or harsh? No. I think it's only fair to them not to go into a marriage with unforgiven sin. And preparing a couple for marriage these days, I'm afraid you have to ask. I was talking to a couple of thousand young people on Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon last week, this week. Uh, about sex and about sex before marriage and so on. And they need to be told. But I'm afraid many preachers seem afraid to raise the subject as if somehow it's a delicate subject. Christ didn't have any visions like that. He went straight in and he said, except for fornication, which in his case would mean something that nearly happened to his own parents recorded, as I say, by Matthew, who understood Jewish community and is writing for young Jewish believers. Hope that makes sense to you, but it means that the exception does not excuse almost any divorce today. I hardly know a divorce that has taken place on the grounds of fornication, understood that way. But that's the only way that makes sense when Jesus says sins like fornication and adultery, 
And Paul says, sins like fornication and adultery. And that phrase occurs at least four times in your New Testament. They are different things. And therefore we have to find some meaning for both words that makes them clearly different. And the most obvious division, even in English, fornication means sex among the unmarried and adultery means sex among the married. And that goes right back to the Greek and even the Hebrew meaning of the two words. And so it all fits together beautifully. And as I've said, I was thrilled to read this book by an American scholar called Jenning, I think that was his name, uh, and to get a scholar really looking at both words in the Hebrew, in the Greek, right through church history. And he, to my mind, has established forever that fornication is sex before marriage. But I just don't know of any divorces today that are based on that sin. But it was in every Jewish community and still is because betrothal is still taken so seriously as virtually marriage without the sex yet. And the word for a separation in that engagement is divorce, still. Well, now let's move on to the example of Jesus. And there are two examples, and for this we turn to John's Gospel. And the two examples are the woman at the well of Samaria whom he met and the other the woman caught in adultery. First is in chapter 4 and the second in chapter 8. Jesus met a woman at the well who was there alone at midday and that was very significant. Women never went to a well at midday in the heat of the sun. They went early morning or late afternoon when it was cool. And here's a woman on her own at midday in the heat of the day at a well. She obviously is ostracized by her community. She comes alone because there's gossip about her. And no wonder, they have a discussion, Jesus and the woman. And Jesus asked her for a drink. Funnily enough, he never got it. But he did get a discussion with her. And uh, she argued with him that the Samaritans who worshipped on the hill of Mount Gerizim in Samaria was better than worshipping on in Jerusalem. And they argued about religion for a bit. And suddenly Jesus said, Bring your husband here to meet me. And she said, I don't have a husband. And he said, how right you are. You've already had five husbands and the man you're living with now is not your husband at all. And that really shook that woman. Jesus knew all about her and told her and she was shattered and she ran back to the town of Samaria. She said, come and meet a man who told me everything I ever did. And she realized he must be the Messiah. And she, was, she became an evangelist straight away and brought a lot of people back with her. Now then, what did Jesus advise her to do about her sexual situation? to repent and put it right. Did he tell her to marry number six, the man she was living with? Did he tell her to go back to number five or back to number four or three or two or first husband? Or did he tell her, now you're converted, now you can look for a Christian husband and marry him? Or did he tell her to remain single? And I'm sorry, but the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> Nobody knows. And it doesn't help us at all. It does help us that he knew all about her and that he knew she was 
terribly mixed up in her relationships. But we just don't know what his advice was to put it right in God's eyes. So we'll have to move on. And now we move on to a story that is often preached about but never properly understood because it's a Jewish story. They caught a woman actually committing adultery in the act itself, physically joined to a man. And they brought her alone to Jesus. That's the first thing they did wrong because the Moses law said both must be punished. But they'd let the man off and he'd run away. And they brought the girl to Jesus and said, we caught her in the very act of adultery. Notice they said Moichaya, they didn't say Pornaya. She was a married woman, or the man she was with was married, but there was a marriage involved in this. And so they brought her and they said, Moses told us to stone her if she committed adultery. And we caught her in the very act don't know how many men there were, but I should think about five or six by the sound of it. And they accused her of this. Now, technically, she should have been stoned, but they'd only brought her to Jesus to trap him. If he said she should be stoned, he'd be in trouble with the Romans who had forbidden capital punishment unless they did it. If he didn't stone her or allow her to be stoned, he would upset all the Jews because he'd be breaking the law of Moses. That was the trap. And Jesus got out of it so neatly, it's amazing. If ever you're in trouble, please go to Jesus because he's the best lawyer you can get. And people don't understand the rest of the story unless they understand Jewish community law. The first of those customs which became a law was that you're not allowed to accuse someone if you have committed the same crime. That's what it means when Jesus said, let him that is without sin throw the first stone. He meant the sin of adultery because you could not be a prosecution witness if you'd ever done the same thing. I mean, if you take without sin to mean that you've got to be perfect before you punish, then it's ridiculous. You could have no policeman. You could not even have a parent punishing a child. Because who's perfect enough to punish anyone? That's a ridiculous interpretation. But a Jew will not interpret it that way. A Jew will say they can accuse her if they've never committed adultery themselves. And Jesus was reminding them of that. The result was that they began to go away. The older ones went first they'd committed adultery. The younger ones stayed and brazened it out and pretended they hadn't, but they had. And finally they too slunk away. And then Jesus stopped doing something. He'd been writing with his finger in the dust. What had he been writing? A Jew will tell you, a Gentile says, oh, it was just to distract him and take his eyes off the girl. Rubbish. In writing with his finger, he was reminding them that the Ten Commandments were written with God's finger. Indeed, he was making a subtle claim that he wrote them. Any Jew would remember that that the Ten Commandments were written with God's finger in stone. And here's Jesus writing with his finger in the dust. I'm speculating, but I'm quite sure he just wrote, you shall not commit adultery. And he's saying, I wrote that. 
My father wrote it and therefore I wrote it. But it's a Jewish mind that would tell you that. Too many Gentile preachers don't read this from a Jewish, with Jewish spectacles on. But you ask a Jew and you'll get all this. So he looked up and he said, where are your accusers? Because the Jewish law said you have to have at least two or three witnesses for the prosecution before there's a case before law. Not one witness, at least two and preferably three witnesses. But now there are none. And now comes the key. Jesus himself was not a witness. And he was only one person. So he couldn't accuse the girl either. Do you see how cleverly he's got the girl off? He now says, case dismissed. Neither do I condemn you. He couldn't, according to Moses' law. And so she was free. It's a very better, clever bit of legal defense. Now, he was not forgiving her. There's no word of forgiveness here. And therefore, we shouldn't say, I, I've had evangelists say this was her moment of being forgiven and born again and so on. It doesn't say that. It just said that Jesus said, I can't condemn you. And that's it. And then comes the crucial phrase, neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. He's calling for repentance on her behalf. And repentance is stopping sinning. He's calling her to end the relationship once and for all. And it's very interesting that once again the Greek tense about sin there is the present continuous. He's telling her to stop a continual habit. It's not just that it, she's done it once, but she's been doing it regularly. It's a habit. And the New International Version of Scripture has captured that tense of the verb. And it translates it, leave your life of sin. She was not an occasional girl who just lapsed once. She was a regular. Either with the same man or with different men. We don't know that. She could have been with one man, a married man, or it could have been with many married men. Might be more likely. But he says, stop your life of sin. End it. Cut it out. End the relationship that is adulterous. Now that is very important. It's true that that part of scripture is not in every one of the early manuscripts of the New Testament. And you'll find a little note on that page to say that story isn't attested by all the early manuscripts. Nevertheless, it rings true with Jesus. It's the sort of thing he would do. And since it's in the Bible now, I accept it as true. Well, now that's his example of what to do when you're caught in an adulterous relationship a continued adulter adulterous relationship. And since that is how Jesus describes remarriage after divorce, in this example he's told us what needs to be done about it. Now time is moving on, so I must move on to what Paul said about this. First, what he said in Romans chapter 7. He makes it absolutely clear in Romans 7 that a woman is married to her husband as long as he is alive and that if she marries another man while her husband is still alive, she has become an adulteress. Very clearly, he's picked up Jesus' teaching here. And remarriage while your former partner is still alive is adultery. 
and Paul agrees wholeheartedly with that. But we turn now to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, on which some base a second ground for divorce. There is a confession, a creed, called the Westminster Confession, which is the creed of all Presbyterians and all Reformed theologians. And that says that there are two grounds for divorce and therefore remarriage, fornication, which they say is adultery, and they find another one in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter 7, in two little words, not bound. And this has become the Protestant attitude to divorce and remarriage. It is allowed now in many Protestant churches on one of the two grounds. I've tried to show you that the ground of fornication is not a ground at all. And that's why I don't believe that. But I often get the Westminster Confession thrown at me when I'm pointing out that Jesus was uncompromising. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 7. He says a number of things. And interestingly enough, the first mention of divorce or separation, same word, he says, I'm quoting the words of the Lord now. This is not from me, it's from the Lord. And he meant Jesus. And he says emphatically, a husband must not separate from her, his wife and a wife must not separate from her husband. That's categorical, no qualifications. But in between those two, two statements is a third, which in your Bible might say, but if she does separate, let her remain single or be reconciled to her partner. Actually, the tense of the verb there, that's got it wrong. It actually says, if she has already separated, is already divorced, let her remain single or be reconciled to her husband. In other words, remarriage is not an option. And he's talking about the case where a divorced wife becomes a Christian and thinks that now she's converted, she can be remarried. Actually, conversion doesn't alter your married state. And people think divorce and remarriage before conversion can be overlooked, can be forgiven. And the person is now free as a new creation to find a Christian wife or husband. No. That doesn't apply. Whatever contract you enter into before your conversion is not cancelled because Jesus has paid all your debts. If you've taken out a mortgage for your house before your conversion and then you say, oh, hallelujah, Jesus has paid all my debts. I don't owe the housing association anything. You try that on. <laughs> and you'll very quickly be told that your conversion may have affected your spiritual standing, but it hasn't cancelled contracts that you entered into beforehand, or your marriage that you entered in beforehand. If you're married when you converted, you're still married afterwards. If you're divorced before your conversion, you're still a divorcee afterwards. If you're single before you converted, you're still single. Conversion doesn't alter the situation at all. But I hear many preachers who say, now you're converted, you can forget the divorce and marriage. That's past. And that was the old man and you finished with him. Don't believe it. So he's saying, if when you come to Christ, you are already divorced, 
you have no option but to remain single or be reconciled to your partner again. That's the only two options. Now the verse that is the subject of a lot of debate is this. He is talking about different marriages and he said supposing there's a marriage between a believer and an unbeliever. We'll say the wife is a believer and the husband isn't. It's a situation that should not have arisen because we are told clearly in scripture that a Christian can only marry a believer. But there are many mixed marriages in existence where one partner is a Christian and the other is not. Some have arisen because the Christian partner has found Christ after the marriage. And that's a legitimate mixed marriage. But there are many illegitimate mixed marriages where a wife has convinced herself she can change her husband after they're married. That's a fatal decision to make, not just in faith, but in every way. And uh, I remember preparing a couple for marriage and in the middle, the girls pointed to the boy's clothes and she said, he won't dress like that after we're married. <laughs> I, I was startled and I said, you better not marry him. If you think you can change him after he's married, you've got another thing coming because marriage doesn't change men. <laughs> They're usually the, pretty much the same afterwards. And I said to her, are you in love with the man you're going to make him into, or the man as he is? And that was the important question at that time. So there are some women who have the fond idea, he'll come round after the marriage and I'll take, get him to go to church with me then. Some Fiancés are fooled by a shallow profession of faith by the other partner. And they say, oh, it's all right, he's, he's come to church and he's said he'll be a Christian. Don't you trust that? Have a time of separation and see if he becomes a Christian without you, I say to such girls. So a mixed marriage shouldn't arise, but it does and you get an unequal yoked partnership. And that's what Paul is dealing with here. And he says, the believing partner must not leave the unbeliever, therefore must not get divorced. But he did say, and it's important this, he said, if the unbeliever wants out of the marriage, you must let him go. After all, he never intended to marry an unbeliever, a believer. And he wakes up in bed one day and finds he's in bed with a Christian. That's a shock for a man or a woman the other way round. To find that your partner with whom you thought you shared everything is now suddenly a believer and has got a religion that you never wanted, that you didn't intend. And Paul does give permission to let the unbeliever out of the marriage if they want to go. For the sake of peace within the household, says Paul. For the sake of peace, so much struggle, so much disharmony can come into a marriage when one becomes a Christian and the other doesn't. And Peter gives instruction to wives in a mixed marriage like that. He says, don't preach at them. You must win him without a word by being more beautiful to live with and more beautiful to look at. Those are the two ways an unbelieving wife scripturally can win their husband, by just being a better wife to him by taking care of her appearance, so he gets a more beautiful wife from Jesus, 
and by living as a good wife with him. In other words, you might win him for Christ if you convince him he's got a better wife since she became a Christian. That makes sense, doesn't it? And it's there in the epistle of Peter. But back to 1 Corinthians 7. A believer married to an unbeliever, unbeliever once out of the marriage, the believer should let them go for the sake of peace. And then comes the crucial phrase, for the believer is not bound. And it was a man called Erasmus, a humanist, yet a Christian priest in the Roman Church before the Protestant Reformation, who said that means they're free to remarry when the unbeliever, unbeliever is gone. He was a humanist who wanted to make divorce and remarriage easier. And he translated the New Testament into Greek, a new Greek New Testament. And very naughtily, he added a word in there that was not in the original Greek and persuaded Luther and Calvin who used his Greek New Testament. It was the only one they had. And he added a word into the Greek of not this passage, but Matthew 19. And where it said, except for fornication, it actually says not for fornication. But he added in the little word, if, if not for fornication. But you could easily have added in a word after, not even for fornication. Whichever way, you're adding words to Scripture. And it was on the basis of Erasmus that the Westminster Confession included here a reason for divorce. You can divorce and remarry if an unbelieving partner has left you, is the teaching still in many churches. And that is easily stretched to if a believer leaves, you can divorce and remarry. And that's now being taught in church. They've missed the tense of the verb, not bound. And they've missed the word bound. It is not the word that is used for marriage bond, which Paul and others freely used. That was quite a different word, you must take my word for it, or check up with someone who can check up the Greek for you. At the end of this chapter, Paul uses the word bond for marriage. But when he says you were not bound, he's using the word enslaved. And he's using it in the past tense. He's not talking about the future. He's not saying you're not bound for the future. He says, for you were not enslaved. If you'd been enslaved, you'd have to stay in that marriage. But you can let them go because marriage is not slavery. He says nothing about the future. He is not saying you're now free to remarry. He's saying at your first marriage to that unbeliever, you were not enslaved to him. And therefore, you, you don't need to stay in the marriage. He doesn't say you can get out of it. He says let the unbeliever go. You're not slaves to each other. It wasn't that sort of marriage. That's all he's saying. So quite frankly, if you go into this carefully, I do not believe for a moment that he was saying you're free to remarry if the unbeliever wants out of your present marriage. Well now, I think I've said enough. If you want to know more, get my little book on the subject, which goes into more detail. But there's something else to say. What has the church said through the centuries? And the answer is it's gone through five stages. 
<clears throat> the early stage of the church was what we call the period of the fathers, the early teachers in the church, after the scripture was completed or while it was being completed. And the answer is very clear. It's a rather unusual answer. They allowed divorce for centuries, but didn't allow remarriage. They distinguished between the two. Then came the time of Augustine, and he was anti-sexual, and uh, because of his early life, and therefore he introduced the idea of celibacy for the priesthood, which is still the case with Roman Catholic churches. And he said that even sex in marriage is wrong. He had an extreme reaction to his illegitimate son and mistress of his earlier life. And he made marriage a sacrament. It's never called that in the Bible. It is a covenant. But to make it one of seven sacraments, we believe in two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. But the Roman Catholics believe in seven, one of which is marriage. And regarded as so sacred that it cannot be broken. The Roman Catholic Church is the only denomination today who disciplines over divorce. They have found a way around it called annulment, and they do declare some marriages annulled because they were never consummated or because they were forced into the marriage, and so they do annul a few marriages and the Pope can separate a man and his wife on the grounds of annulment. That's what the English King Henry VIII wanted. And when the Pope wouldn't give it to him, Henry VIII set himself up as the head of the church in England and destroyed all the Roman Catholic monasteries. It's an extraordinary story. Church of England was born out of that divorce. And I'm afraid when there's a crack in the foundation, sooner or later it appears on the top. And that's what's happening today. The Church of England is being torn apart by questions of sexual ethics. But when a church is born out of a divorce, there's a crack in the foundation which will ultimately show God is not in a hurry, is he? The third stage was the medieval stage in the church when marriage became a sacrament and could only be annulled on certain very few grounds. Then came the Protestant Reformation and Erasmus' version of the New Testament, which he'd added that word if to, and that has colored all the official Protestant churches, which tend, whether they look to Luther or Calvin, to allow divorce and remarriage. The Westminster Confession allows divorce and remarriage on two grounds, adultery, which they said Jesus gave, and desertion, which they said Paul gave. I've tried to show you that neither is true to scripture but many Christians accept the Westminster Confession. And on the whole, they've stayed with those two things. The modern church, the Anglican church, has found a way around it, and it blesses remarriages in the name of Christ. It won't conduct them, but it will bless them, which seems to me the height of contradiction. But that's what the Anglican Church in Britain does. The free churches on the whole have made it a relative matter and judge each case by its merits. And that has introduced what a theologian called Fletcher called situational ethics, in which you start not with principles, not with scripture, you start with the situation 
and decide in that situation what's the loving thing to do. For Fletcher, love was the only principle, the only absolute. And therefore you ask, what is the most loving thing to do in this situation? And he calls that Christianity, but many churches do that. Uh, the Methodists do it, the Congregationals do it, the Baptists, some of them do it. But that's the situation. And most churches now in Britain have what are called divorce recovery workshops in which they help divorcees cope with the loss and cope with. It's worse than an unbereavement, than a bereavement for some divorcees because if the husband had died, they can cope with that. That's something settled and sealed. It can't be undone. But a husband who's divorced them, knowing he's still alive, and even maybe with someone else, that's a painful experience. And so these divorce recovery workshops have sprung up, and evangelical churches have them. Unfortunately, as part of that divorce recovery, they teach that now you're free to marry someone else. And that is surely right against Jesus' teaching. And in a church near us, which we attend, they have a divorce recovery workshop run by divorced and remarried couples. Quite incredible. So finally, in the last minute or two, what should we say? We should not work by precedent. If only we knew what Jesus said to the woman at the well, we could then work by precedent. And what people want me to write is a great thick book covering every possible situation and what we should do in it. And I'm not going to write that. Precedent is not the thing to appeal to because every situation is different. It's amazing what complications people can get into. The thing to do is to work by principle and apply the principles to the situation, not tackle the situation on its own and say what is the loving thing to do, but apply the principles of scripture to the situation. And there are just four principles. The principle of sin. Adultery is sin. Let's call it that. Second, the principle of forgiveness. Divorce is not the unforgivable sin, nor is remarriage the unforgivable sin. They can both be forgiven. But the third principle is the principle of repentance. And that's where it really comes to be very harsh and cruel in some people's eyes. The principle of repentance is that you stop sinning, that you leave that relationship. Yes, even with remarriage. And as soon as I say that, Somebody will say, but what if there are children? Were you already thinking that? It's funny, but the people who are concerned about children, when a remarriage is left, don't seem concerned about children who are left behind when a divorce takes place. Why aren't they concerned about the children then? They only seem to raise the question, about a remarriage, but what about all the children damaged severely by divorce? It is extremely damaging to the whole life of children when their parents separate. Even if they see both parents again regularly, the damage that is done, it is far more likely that when the children marry, they too will separate, gets passed on. And the children whose mental and emotional life have been damaged for the rest of their lives, 
by the divorce that happened when they were children is colossal. Any psychiatrist will tell you that. Any psychologist will tell you that. And the figures prove it. And it's amazing how many Christians argue. I've learned my lesson and my second marriage won't break up. Actually, statistically, a second marriage is far more likely to break up and a third marriage even more until you're in and out of marriages like Elizabeth Taylor becomes a habit. All the statistics back up Jesus' view of divorce and remarriage. And if you are remarried and therefore living in adultery, I can only say, not on my opinion, not, but on Jesus' authority, end your life of sin. Get out of it. Make every arrangement you can to relieve the children and look after them and love them, but get out of the adulterous relationship. The fourth principle is discipline in the church, that the church ought to be helping to follow Jesus' standard, but it isn't. And the church of today is not discipling people. It's not teaching them to observe whatever Christ commanded. It is ignoring this because it's now so prevalent. I hope it's not prevalent in Singapore. I don't know, perhaps you can tell me afterwards, but um, it will be. The more liberal secularism takes over society, the more marriage becomes a contract and not a covenant, and then you're in trouble. Please don't do what the British churches have done and rob the world of a prophetic voice that speaks on behalf of Jesus Christ.